All right, now we'll start with the center support and work our way into the drums. So, before we get into it, I'm gonna cover something that is super important. So, the inner lip seal for the center support is nearly identical in size and dimension to the uh, perimeter lip seals for the forward and direct clutch pistons. So, how you can tell them apart is two ways. One, you can carefully study the angles of the sealing surface relative to the engagement surfaces. The forward and direct clutch seals have a steeper angle than does the inner seal for the center support. That's one way you can do it. But the best way to do it is to simply look very carefully at the inner lip seal surface here for a part number. Okay, the forward and the direct clutch perimeter seals for those pistons are going to have a part number that is 8828078. I don't know to what extent you can see that, but I'll flash a picture just in case you can't. And the part number for the center support is going to be 8674425. I believe that's what it says. So, if you mix and match these seals by accident, then you're gonna have all kind of problems in both overdrive as well as whatever drum got the wrong, you know, whatever piston got the wrong seal in either the forward or direct drum. So make doubly sure that you validate that you have the correct lip seals with the correct parts. It's another reason why I like to leave the lip seals in for most of the transmissions I do. Um, there's going to be some that I'm just so super familiar with, plus there's not, you know, uh, any kind of lip seals that are real similar in size, but in the 204Rs, this is a perfect example, a textbook example of lip seals that are visually identical at a glance, and unless you really take a closer look, you may, uh, you know, you may not realize that and install the wrong lip seal in the wrong part. Alright, so from a a sealing surface perspective, the direction for the inner lip seal is going to be facing the piston this way. And the same is true for the perimeter lip seal. They're both going to be facing down into the center support. And I may even make that last little bit a standalone video just so that it's not buried you know, in the heart of this you know, much larger assembly video. Alright. Just go in and carefully work your lip seal in the, in the position, in the groove. Believe it or not, these two seals can be a little tricky because there's not much access. Go around carefully. As usual, don't force anything and just double check. Make sure that the lip seal is 100% seated, 360 degrees around the groove. That's it.
Okay, just carefully use a pick to fully seat it. You know, you're gonna have sections that are kind of caught up or, you know, for lack of a better term, kinked. Okay, you do this multiple times, the seal itself will kind of relax and then just settle in as it needs to. Okay, this one you have to stretch over into position a little bit. kind of rotate it into position. And then just go around it once like this, just to make doubly sure that it's fully seated into that groove. You know, one or two trips around and that should be good. All right, so Center support is effectively done. Just leave your sizing tool on there or your uh, hose clamps or whatever you're using. Uh, the snap ring for the center support, it's also directional. So you got a flat side that's gonna go face down against the center support. So, you know, we'll go like this. And just like the uh, low reverse support snap ring, we're gonna index this 180 out from the parking pole area. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and do the direct drum. So here's your, your drum seal. Okay, just squeeze and then get a pick in there and then yank it out. And if you need to, use a dull 45 degree pin to work it in. If you're dual feeding, you're not gonna install this lip seal. Okay, dual feeding, you'll leave this out. You'll leave the center ceiling ring off the drum. I'm, excuse me, off the center support. And then you will use a non-feed bolt in the high reverse passage. So if we're looking at the center support, this is the high reverse passage, this is the direct passage, forward clutch feed, and overdrive feed. Okay, dual feeding is something you want to do when engine power exceeds, you know, 400, 425 horsepower. You're in that neighborhood, you need to seriously consider dual feeding this clutch. Okay, and now we'll do pistons. I should say the piston. All 
All right, you got new piston lip seals and old lip seals. Go ahead and toss the old lip seals far away from the new lip seals so you don't mix them up. Okay, I think that went up on the top shelf. All right. So both these lip seals are going to go in facing down with the lip facing down into the drum. Okay, if you haven't done so already, check the drum's bleeder ball. Okay, make sure it's moving. Same with the piston. Now make sure that a little bleeder ball capsule is making noise. If it's not, shoot a whole bunch of brake cleaner in there and move it around with a pick. 99% of the time, it's just got some crud in there from you know its previous life, and you know it just needs to be flushed out. Um, I don't think I've ever seen one of these bad, or if I have, it'd be at most one time. Okay, check your apply ring. All right, you want the small side radius um, installed. Okay, this is a 485 thousandths tall ring. The uh, four drum, which takes one that you can install into this piston here for if you need to for whatever reason, uh, that's 525 thousandths tall. Okay, so just carefully install the piston, and you're going to have to use your lip seal tool to get it around the journal, and then just apply a little bit of downward pressure as you go all the way around, that's it. Try to hold it level too. The more level it is, the easier it'll go in. Okay, if you're doing real high performance, high RPM, you want to consider, at bare minimum, making sure that you have a return spring assembly that has all 16 return springs installed. Uh, I have a separate video on forward and direct drums for this transmission, and it gets into greater detail, but bottom line is that there's two different uh, spring retainers, at least that I've seen. Um, this one which we're going to use because that's what came out of here and this is a mild build it has it has spring bosses that are flared only for 10 of the 16 positions the other six are not flared so you can't really install springs there I mean I guess you can if you want but I wouldn't recommend it because there's nothing really holding them in place um, other than you know the force of the return spring assembly uh, you know tension uh, via the snap ring so you know, again, that's that's a judgment call, but it's not something I've ever done. Anytime we're doing one of these and we need to swap, I'll use the other spring retainer that has flares on all 16 positions. I don't know what I'm doing there. So this uh, spring seat has the cutout there for the piston, uh, for the piston's bleeder ball, I should say. It's like I'm all over the place. I okay, just want to make sure that you line all that up. And then as far as where you put the snap or put the spring retainer, it doesn't matter in the snap ring. So orient your snap ring like this. So when you go to the foot press or your spring compressor, you make sure you have all four um, engagement locking tabs making contact with the snap ring so there's, there's no gap. Okay, let me seat this and then we'll come back and install the clutch pack. Okay, clutch pack. So we have six frictions, six flat steels, no wave plate or cushion plate of any kind. And then I also have a one thou thick 
um, flat steel that's uh, here just in case I need to take up additional clearance. So what I'm shooting for in this drum is between 60 and 70 thousandths of an inch. So the general rule of thumb is you want one, uh, excuse me, 10 thousandths of an inch of clearance per friction disc that you're installing. And that holds true of, you know, with all clutch packs and all transmissions, at least all GM transmissions of roughly speaking, you know, this diameter and this surface area. Okay, I'm just lining up all the wide cutouts on the lugs. You're going in the same positions. I don't know how critical that is. More of just a habit, I think, than anything else. So you have five clutch drums and six clutch drums. You never want to use a five clutch drum for anything even remotely performance. So as you can see, we are just a hair below the snap ring groove. So by eye, this is not a, you know, I can't really tell exactly what clearance I have. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of between 60 and 80 thousandths of an inch. 80 is a little on the high side for me. If that's where we end up when we do the check, then I'll swap in a, a 100 thousandths thick steel. I want to say 1 thousandths. I don't know why. Um, stupid flies. So if you're going to swap in thicker steels, and any, this is true of any clutch pack anywhere, you want the thickest steels at the bottom, whether it be the drum or uh, you know whatever's closest to the applied piston, because that's where more heat is going to be present. There's going to be more heat building up at the bottom than there is at the mouth of the clutch pack. And like I said, these snap rings can be, you know, kind of ornery. At least at first. Until you get a whole bunch of lugs engaged, then you're good. Alright, um, I'm going to set this aside, and then we'll go ahead and uh, resume with the forward. And we'll get that all set up. Don't know if I'll need that yet. Okay, so for the Ford drum, they're all going to have this thrust washer here. They're also going to have a bleeder bowl. So just like with the direct drum, I'm going to shake it, make sure that that ball is moving. So. With these drums, there's two different versions. Uh, there's the early version, which is what we're working with, and it was a later version that did not have a bleeder ball because it came with an aluminum piston that had bleeder orifices in the piston itself. Okay, so you just want to be aware of that. Okay, out with the old seals and in with the new seals. Okay, same deal. The sealing surface of the lip seal is going to face down toward the drum for both of these lip seals. So, for the inner seal, it may not be quite as obvious, but this is the sealing surface, so that's going to face down. In this case, it's going to face up because we have the piston upside down. Let's just kind of scrunch it in there. I mean, be gentle with it. Okay, then you got your apply ring, and again, this is going to be a little taller, 525 thousandths. Just so I don't get sloppy, a sloppier. If 
you're wondering where you can get these lip seal tools, um, I got this one on eBay and then there's a whole bunch that I received from whatever it takes transmission. So uh, that's Wit Trans and they sell, in addition to transmission parts, uh, all kind of specialty tools as well. So, you know, if you need a transmission specific tool, you know, check out their website. If they don't have it, more than likely, um, you know, they'll have information about where you might be able to get it. The other thing too is your local hard parts supplier, whoever you get your hard parts from, you know, things like drums and clutches and, uh, you know, gears, whatever. Uh, they should also, they should also have a, uh, you know, a selection of tools available as well, even if they have a special order of them. So, this is going to be your little snap ring, same deal, you want to make sure it's oriented so you have all four lock bosses engaged. Okay, press down on your piston, make sure it's fully seated. If it's not, you go to install this, then um, you may tear the lip seal. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. So unlike the uh, direct clutch pad, which as far as I know, the backing plate's not selective in the forward clutch, the backing plate is selective. So this is the backing plate and this one is a number eight. This is going to be its identifier. It's 208 thousandths thick. So there's, I want to say five or six, and I'll flash a chart on the screen that has all the sizes, but there's five or six different backing plates. One of them is not stamped with any kind of identifier. It's just blank. So um, I believe they range in thickness from 150 thousandths to, I want to say 250 thousandths, somewhere in there. And like I said, the chart will have all the information, but um, bottom line is that you have different thickness of backing plates. You also have different thicknesses of flat steel. The frictions are all the same. So we got four frictions, four steels, and you have 74 thou in this pack. And then there is an 86 thousandth uh, thick flat steel available as well if you need to tighten this up. So clearance in this drum, is I believe between 28 and 52 thousandths. Um, it's a non-working clutch. In other words, it's not really shifting other than to engage and drive. It remains applied as long as you're in a forward range setting. It doesn't matter what gear you're in. So you can run these down to, I would say 30, maybe even 25 thousandths. But um, my recommendation is to stick with the guideline of between 30 and 45 thousandths. That's just my personal um, advice there, you know, what I manage to. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of flexibility as far as what you can do with, uh, you know, swapping out different thick steels or the backing plate to get your clearance where you need it to be. All right, I got a glove that's torn apart, so let me go change that up and then uh, we'll resume. Okay, so let's see what we got. Um, in addition to these, you may see, uh, I'm just installing four flat steels, but you may see um, a stack up that includes a wave plate or a cushion plate on the bottom. And then you may also see a stack up that includes a cushion plate on the bottom and then a cushion plate, a uh, wave plate as the top steel as well. So that would be two flat steels and two cushion plates. Uh, I would never recommend you set up transmission like that, at least not this clutch. Um, one cushion plate is enough. So I typically won't run any, but if you run, if you run one, that's not the end of the world, but I would not recommend you run two. Okay, that feels like it's about 50 thousandths clearance to me. So 
I'm going to grab an 86 thou steel and I'm going to insert it on the bottom in the place of the bottom steel that's in there now. And then we'll, we'll check it when the time comes. I marred up the backing plate there. Marred up the backing plate, not happy about that. That's snap ring. Both of these snap rings are the same and they're both a pain. Now that doesn't happen when I'm not filming. It only happens if I'm filming a video. You know, these things are supposed to be inanimate objects. They're not supposed to have a mind of their own. They're certainly not supposed to cause me grief when I'm trying to do this. That's still a little much. I might go grab another 86 thou plate. But we'll measure this as is and we'll see where we're at. And then if we need to, uh, we'll go ahead and change it out for another 86 thou steel plate. Okay, um, this is the uh, little thrust washer that goes there. And then if you're not familiar with these transmissions, uh, this bushing is a pain, so my bushing video, at least part one, showing all the removal of bushings or the removal of all bushings. Um, I show the, uh, you know, the process that I use to R and R this one. It's a uh, basically consists of taking a drill with a half inch drill bit, drilling all the way down through it, so that you'll have about maybe 30 or 40 thousandths, um, you know, remaining. And then uh, from there, you just pull it out with a pick or a chisel, you know, whatever's left. And then you press in a new one. Same with the TH350 uh, output shaft bushing. You could do pretty much the same thing. Just drill it out and then, you know, pull it out or pry it out, whatever's left. Okay, here are the scarf cut rings, the new ones that come in the kit. It's always good to pre-wind. So anytime you have a Teflon scarf cut ceiling ring, you should pre-wind it just so that uh, it hugs the ceiling ring groove that much firmer, that much tighter so that you don't risk, uh, you know, it kind of coming out on you and getting caught up when you're trying to slide over. Uh, in this case, it'll be the center support. All right, so what we're gonna do is, I'll go ahead and mate these two. Should I mean lubricate this a little bit? And move your bushings. Okay, when they are fully meshed, you'll have this much space between the bottom of the clutch basket and the forward drum and you know I guess the bottom of the direct drum it'll look like this and you should be able to spin it nice and free all right I'm gonna pull the sizing tool off some support and then carefully seat it we'll move up the bushings for whatever reason today, I don't know what it is. Forgetting to do some basic stuff. Okay. Double check, make sure that uh, center support's fully installed. Believe it or not, smacking it around like that, you know, um, just going real rapid actually 
is better for the ceiling rings because a little bit of vibration kind of helps them um, mesh and seat and collapse into the bore there versus trying to just force it in or push it on where it, you know one of the rings might get caught up which of course would be a disaster so feed bolt into the high reverse And that's going to be your overdrive, so whatever you do, do not put air in there. So, high reverse, direct clutch, and forward clutch. Let me get a different nozzle. Okay, we have about 50 to 60 thousandths worth of clearance. So, let me get another 86 thou steel. Or you can even use direct clutch steels in here too, that's fine. If I don't have another 86, then I'll probably put like a 90 or even a 100 thou. I know I have at least one more of each of them. Okay, stand by. I'm actually going to install a direct clutch uh, steel plate. I'm going to see where we're at with it. Alternatively, I know I could put a wave plate in here, but I'm going to hold off on doing that until it's like last resort. So, it already has one direct clutch steel in here, so now we're going to add another one. The forwards, incidentally, I think I was mistaken, the forwards have 74,000 and 80,000 stick steels, not 86. 86 is a direct steel. So it's another another uh, example of why you want to have multiple different um, uh, versions of the same selective part, whether it be uh, steel plates or thrust washers or spacers. I mean, whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that you're prepared because otherwise you're going to make a lot of trips to your, you know, back and forth to your hard parts supplier. I mean. Even I had to make a few trips uh, with this transmission, you know, thinking I had stock when I didn't. Okay, this should be okay. All right, I'm going to set up the dial indicator and we'll go ahead and we'll do a clearance check. I'm going to have to move the camera. All right, let's see where we are at. So we're like 53, 54 thou, which again is not uh, within spec, not ideal. So uh, looks like we're swapping in one more thicker steel plate.
no big deal. Gotta do what you gotta do. Okay, this is gonna be a hundred thousands. And we got a 290 foul. Actually, this is 86 foul, excuse me. Okay, this is ever so slightly above the uh, top of the snap ring groove, or I should say the bottom of the snap ring groove. So top of the uh, backing plate is just beyond the bottom of the snap ring groove. And that feels way too tight. Okay, we've got a good use bottom steel. So with these transmissions, I'd recommend that you always purchase a steel module. I mean, if for no other reason, so that you can start fresh, but at the same time, if you have um, steels that came out of the transmission that are still in serviceable shape, uh, you can swap them in as well. They become like, you know, spare parts. So, or extras, if you will. Okay. So the looser the clearance you have in the forward pack and uh, reverse, the firmer the engagement's going to be, all other things equal. This feels tight. And put a seventy four foul steel back in. Let's see what we got. So I snake the air nozzle through the legs of the tripod. Still too much. Ah, the joys of building the 204R. Should have left well enough alone, knowing that uh, when you put air into it, clutch clearance opens up based on, you know, or I should say versus what you visually see. Okay, let's see what we got.
I were either thirty nine or forty thousand, so I'm gonna call that good. All right, now I'm gonna remove the forward clutch uh, drum, and then we're gonna test the directs. The rack's probably going to need some work also. Four jumps, I don't know, I was way off. Took a lot more work than I thought it would. Okay, direct clutch feed. Okay, we're at 75 thousands. Okay, I think a single 100 thousandths thick steel will solve our problems. I think. I think, but we'll know for sure until we know. Okay, hundred thousands. All right, so we got a single one hundred thou thick steel at the bottom of the pack, and we have five ninety thou thick steels. So we'll see what happens. I also have two eighty six thou steels here on the bench in the event that we're too tight, so that we could swap those in if we need to. Okay, I think I got my, uh, you know, the wide uh, lugs, I think I got them offset a little bit, but no big deal. I mean, I'll correct it because, I don't know, I'm like OCD about that kind of stuff. Okay. So, ten thousandths of an inch per friction, so 60 to up to 70 thou in this pack for this transmission, this particular transmission. Okay, 60, 62 thousands. Okay, I'm good with all that. Okay, drums are done, so uh, now we're gonna go ahead and um, 
reposition the camera so that we can begin installing uh, the drums and the center support into the case. So before we do that, let me go get the next special tool that we're going to use and I'll introduce you to that. So this is going to be Kenmore J29337. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a lifting tool. Uh, how it works is when the forward and direct clutch drums are meshed, you have a little collet style um, engagement, uh, you know, I guess grabber for lack of a better term. So what you do is you go all the way in with it so it bottoms out and then you can actually retract okay go counterclockwise on the collet until it stops against the drum and then it'll allow you to lift it up and the two drums can be safely uh, hoisted right into the case and then you can you know kind of move them around a little bit just so you can spline the uh, frictions of the forward clutch pack onto that forward clutch hub in the gear trim. So to loosen it and take it off, you just turn it clockwise. Okay, so pretty simple. So when you have Teflon sealing rings, and this is true of any stator that takes Teflon one-piece sealing rings, not just this one. But a lot of times, they won't, you know, the drum or whatever it is that's sealing against those rings will not want to come off of the part uh, that has the, uh, you know, that has the rings. So, I'm going to try to take it off. But you see it's kind of, you know, it wants to stay on there. So, so take a big flat blade screwdriver just gently pry up and that will allow you to separate the drums or the drum and the center support and turn it upside down and then you just want to check your sealing rings make sure that no harm was done and put your sizing tool back on And then now we'll go ahead and mesh everything, make sure that your thrust washer is in position. And then one other thing too, you could drill these out if you want. Uh, I mentioned this in the drums video, but uh, you can drill these out, um, enlarge them to the width of the lug, and then you know chamfer and or deburr them so that they don't create a problem. For this build, it's not necessary, but for high performance, I do all that. Again, it allows more oil, um, you know, cooling oil to wash over the direct clutch pack. And I actually may, before I go back with this, I may do that here. Um, so don't be surprised if you see some holes enlarged. Uh, you can do every other hole or you can do every hole. doesn't matter. Or every third hole. So let me reposition the camera, bring the case back over, and we'll proceed. Okay, just purely FYI for right now, uh, when you go to install your drums for the final time, you actually need to install the band first, but for right now, we're going to leave it out because, like I said, I'm 99% certain that this selective little washer there is probably not going to be the right one. If it is, great, I mean, you know, minimizes the amount of iterations and, you know, uh, rework that I'd have to do, but like I said, I highly doubt that that's going to be the case. All right, so just make sure your tool is firmly held in place and then just start rotating the assemblies until they're fully splined on.
And what you want to do, I mean, you can't see me doing it, but what you want to do is line up the uh, female lugs in the direct drum with the male lugs on the sun shell. And then just start uh, shimmying it while you rotate everything. Okay, I'm just making doubly sure that I'm fully engaged. I think I am. And incidentally, the lugs on the sun shell uh, are not going to make contact, you know, the base of the lugs on the direct drum. There's going to be a little bit of a gap. So I'm going to take a picture of it so I can flash that on the screen while we're doing this. And you can see what that looks like. All right. So nine sixteenths on this little flat. Okay, the drum should rotate nice and easy. All right, now what you need to do is lube up the entire case. You know, just lube up the entire bore because the center support is a slip fit. So it's going to be real snug going in. This is why I wear gloves because this will get real messy real quick. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast working on these things. Move up your bushings in the center support. Lube up the, uh, the ceiling rings as well, or the lip seals, I should say. And the ceiling rings are also uh, also good candidates for lube. Okay, make sure your thrust washer is in place. Line up your feed passages or feed bolt locations at the six o'clock position, and then just carefully lower it in. Now you don't want it sitting up too long because then those ceiling rings are not going to want to seat fully. Hey, it looks like I'm off. Got our come. Got to come this way. Oh, actually, no, I'm good. Okay. Thought I was off. I said this way. I meant uh, counterclockwise. I thought I was one full, you know, bolt pull off, but not the case. Ten millimeters on these bolts and then we'll install the snap ring for the center support and that snap ring will be indexed so that the uh, ends of the ring will be over here somewhere basically 180 degrees out from the parking pole and uh, the you know side of the case where the parking linkage is located Now these bolts don't have to be super tight, just snug them. That's all you really need to do. Okay, so the uh, center support snap ring, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, directional, so the beveled side faces up. And then you want to index it so that the uh, ends are roughly 180 degrees out from the you know parking linkage area. Just 
going to collapse it like this. You know, do the best you can to work it in. And the best that you can do to keep it away from the machine surfaces. And then just make sure it's um, fully seated. Okay, so center support and snap ring are in. So now we gotta reattach the tool. In fact, I'm gonna install that thrust washer just to serve as a uh, you know, kind of a foundation. It's not going to make a difference in terms of travel. Not engaged, not married. Okay, now I'm going to try to lift up on it just to again get a hasty reading and then we'll see where we're at. You don't want this too hard and fast against the uh, center support because then you won't be able to move it. So just back, you know, all the way down and I'll back it off a little bit. That's actually not as bad as I was uh, thinking it was going to be. Let me set up a dial indicator, I'll reposition the camera and we'll take an initial travel check. Okay, we got the dial indicator set up. So what I like to do is come in just like this underneath. So I don't want to grab it with one hand, I want to grab it with two hands because I want to lift straight up on it because it's very easy to cock this thing sideways and throw off your reading. So it looks like 51 thousandths. I knew we were way out, it was just, you know, it was a question of how much. So I'm gonna put a much thicker spacer in there. Uh, I'll measure the one that's in there now. I think it's like 89 or 90 thousandths of an inch, but I'll double check and then we'll find one that's gonna give us an additional 25 to 30 thousandths in terms of uh, uh, thickness so that we can get that travel between the 15 and 25 thousand spec that we need. And to get the center support and everything back out of the case, the easiest thing to do is hook the tool back up once you have the snap ring and the two bolts out and just lift up on it until everything comes out. All right, so we have a number seven in here. Let's see how thick it is. So you'll want to measure this on anywhere on this washer other than the little ID tab. So 90 thousandths thick. So we were getting 50 thousandths. We need to be at between 15 and 25. So we've got to reach in and see what we can come up with. So we have a spacer that's uh, number 11, 
and looks like this is going to be 115 thou thick. Okay, so that's 25 thousandths greater. That should put us at the very top end. Let me see if I have one that's thicker than that. Okay, I got a 125 thou thick spacer, maybe 124. I'm actually going to go with the thicker spacer because I don't want to have to do this twice, and I'm perfectly okay with. Uh, you know, having a little bit tighter here. Um, however, the one thing you have to consider is what your rear end play was. For us, I think we ended up with um, seven or eight thousandths of an inch. So you wanna make sure that you are uh, not less here than you are there, okay? So rear end play must always be less than the travel here. Okay, um, I know I said I didn't want to do this twice, but I'm going to have to. Uh, the band is soaking in the uh, bin. I completely spaced on that. So uh, no matter what end play figure we get here, this is coming back out again at least one more time. Okay, uh, we're back with the indicator. Uh, we swapped out the uh, you know little washer. So I'm going to come in from this side, lift up, and we'll see where we're at. So it looks like we are somewhere in the neighborhood of between 11 and 13 thousandths. So it's 12 thousandths. Yeah, so 10, 12 thousandths. Um, I didn't put the band in, so it would have to come out anyway. I'm gonna put that other spacer back in there that was uh, 10 thousandths thinner than the one that's in there now, and then we should be done. Okay, so here is the uh, number 13 washer that was in there. So we're gonna swap it with the number 11 washer. This should give us somewhere between 20 and 25 thousandths worth of travel. So like I said earlier, we have to install the band first before we install the drums. So this is gonna be your band anchor pin location and then this is gonna be your apply point. So I'm just gonna collapse it in and nest it right in here. Okay, just like that. Put the light so you can see. So you got your band in. Just make sure it's nice and level. Make sure that uh, the band anchor pin location is fully seated. You're good to go there. Okay, and then grab your band anchor pin itself and then uh, go ahead and install it.
All right, now I'm gonna reinstall the two drums for the final time. So you want to be super careful not to nick the band. Okay, it'll slide right inside of it as long as you're slow and deliberate. Make sure you're real tight against that drum with the lock and collar. Okay, we're not going to install the center support yet, so if you haven't done so, put your put your uh, sizing tool back on your ceiling rings, assuming you're running Teflon rings. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check servo and uh, apply point alignment. Come in just a little bit. All right, so now what we have to do is install the servo without any seals on it and uh, check for servo travel and band clearance. I want to do that before we install the center support. And the one thing you want to do, at least I do this, uh, is you want to make sure that this applied point is actually lined up with the bore. And a lot of times these bands, um, you know, they don't stay aligned. So I'll just take a screwdriver and I'll just leave it in there. And I'll check my, you know, through the servo board, check my alignment and, you know, looks like it's fine. So once I have the servo in, then obviously the screwdriver will come out. But for now, you can just leave it in there. Okay, so here's the servo assembly. Again, no ceiling rings or anything like that on it. So we have it fully assembled. I haven't even changed out the old um, ceiling rings here on the pin. Um, I mean, you could leave them on if you want. It doesn't really matter, but make sure you do not install any new seals that came in your kit or from CK Performance or wherever you're getting your servo. Um, if, you know, you, there's probably gonna be a lot of trial and error here and you don't wanna take a chance marring them up. All right, install the servo. And once you see it engage the band, then you can take that other screwdriver out of the way. And then what I do is I'll just take a hammer against my belly and I'll um, basically force my way against the case and install the uh, snap ring with the servo fully compressed. So it looks kind of awkward but that's how I have to do it. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm just checking 
I have way too much band clearance. Let me get you over and you can take a look. All right, look at all that travel. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to shim this servo. CK Performance designed these so that you don't have to do this. However, that is predicated on you using a uh, drum that is factory um, dimension, you know, in terms of its diameter. This drum, we had to remove almost 30 thousandths worth of material. So I have a whole bunch of shims that uh, I've accumulated over the years for, you know, this exact situation. So what we're going to do is install those shims on the back of the pin and hopefully be able to tighten this up so that it'll work. Okay, so there's a bunch of shims in here. Let's break into this baggie. So they're all different thicknesses so that uh, you can kind of dial in your travel as you need it. So what we want is either 75 to 125 thousandths of inward travel on the servo or one eighth of an inch longitudinal travel um, of the band on the drum. Okay, so I'm gonna stick, hmm. I'm gonna just stick three washers, three thick washers and see where that leaves me. All right. Okay. Um, I think I'm close to where I need to be in terms of servo travel. So I have a contraption set up with a dial indicator. The indicator is stable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically push in or press in while I'm grabbing the fixture and the inside of the uh, uh, case board here on the servo and see how much that dial indicator is moving. So again, we want to be between 75 and 125 thousandths worth of travel. Any more than that is considered out of spec. And this procedure and these specs apply to both the 204R, the 700R4, and the 4L60E, all variants, all years. Okay, you want to go to full bind when that servo pin is all the way in, fully applied against that band, and it's grabbing that drum. So that reading showed us 160 thousandths. I want to just take one more measurement just to be sure. So looks like we got to knock off 35 thousandths worth of travel. So I'm going to take the servo out. I'll show you what I've put in behind, um, or I should say on the back of that pin to get the travel even close to where I need to be. And keep in mind, this drum has been machined um, by about at least 25 to 30 thousandths of an inch. Uh, that's what my machinist told me that he took off. So, uh, okay. Got the snap ring off, so is your cover. And then here's the servo. And looks like it's all gonna come out. So this is what I did just to get me in the ballpark. I took a spacer from the shift kit, and then I augmented that with a crush washer from God knows where that just happens to fit and be the, just the right inside and outside diameter. So I'm gonna add one more shim to this. Uh, it's gonna be something, like I said, I need to shave 20 to 25 thousandths. So let me go find a shim and then we'll put this back in and check it again.
Okay, that's 60 thousandths, that's a little too big. A little too much, I should say. Yeah, that's 30,000, so I'm gonna go with that. Okay, old hammer against the belly. Nope. Try again. Set up the contraption one more time. All right, I'm gonna push it in to where it's fully applied. It can't go in any further, and we'll see what we got. Okay, that's 60 thousandths worth of travel. So what I need to do is take out one of those gold shims and put a thinner gold shim or a silver shim and we should be good. I'm just gonna swap out a gold shim for a silver one, it's half as thick. Okay, so here's the lineup, as goofy as it is. So I'm gonna put a gold shin first, then this crush washer, then your two silver shims. Before I install this for the final time, I'm going to attempt to locate a flat washer that's dimensionally identical to this crush washer. I don't think it'll be a big deal to install it with a crush washer that's, you know, by design a little bit offset, you know, uh, one end is a little higher than the other, but if I can avoid doing that, I will. If I can't, then I will uh, notify the customer and let him know what the, you know, the situation is, just so he's aware and he can veto it and say, hey, you know, get a different drum, and then that's what we'll do. But, unfortunately, all this stuff costs money, so, you know, we've got to figure out ways to solve these problems without incurring any additional costs, um, you know, as our primary imperative.
All right, let's see what we got. Hey, that's eighty thousands. Ninety thousands. All right. Okay, the band is free on the drum, so what I'm gonna do is take this out, install the uh, seals, and then put this in for the final time, do an air check. As long as it's grabbing the drum firmly, positively, where that drum is not moving whatsoever, then I'm gonna call this good. All right, so there's a servo. So you're gonna have two boot seals. This is your piston, this is your cover. So, each lip seal is going to face the opposite direction. So the larger lip seal, which goes on the inner portion of the servo, is going to face inboard. So apply fluid is going to come. It's going to seal against this servo here, or this seal here, rather. And then your smaller seal is going to be uh, oriented in the opposite direction so that the lip seal is facing this way, so toward the cover. and put your cover seal on. Sorry, it's been a long day. And then now we have to put on our two servo pin seals. So you use just um, butt cut ceiling rings, so not scarf cut. <clears throat> they, uh, you know, the ends kind of come to a butt, so to speak. Uh. So just compress them to the extent you can. I kind of stretch that one out a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't cause me problems. All right, you protect the spacer. Oops. Then your shim pack. So I got the gold shim. The crush washer and then we have the silver shim which I don't know what I did with that I think I might have misplaced it back into the drawer all right let me go grab it it's a 30 thousandths thick silver colored shim Okay, then your spring. So you have the inner spring and then the intermediate spring. And again, with this servo, you do not use the intermediate servo element. So you leave that out completely. With the Transgo kits, you basically leave off 
the scarf cut sealing ring on it, but you still install it. All right, I'm gonna install this, so we'll take you back over to the case. Okay, like any servo install, lube up the bore. Be super generous with the lube. Both the main bore as well as the pin bore. Now you don't want that pin bore dry, so lube it up to the extent you can. Use a different brush if you have to get in there. You know, something smaller or whatever. Main thing is, like usual, you don't want to skimp on the lube. And I'll put a little bit of green assembly lube on that lower ceiling ring there. Just to make doubly sure that there's no problems going in. Okay, I'm going to position the hammer handle once again. Feels okay. Gonna check the band and the drum by rotating the drum, make sure it's not bound up. I'll bring you over just a second, but you can hear the drum turning. So that looks good so far. Okay, let me uh, air up the compressor and then we'll do an air check. So to air check the intermediate servo, you're gonna put your nozzle in at this location right here. So. This is your, gonna be your um, third accumulator check ball capsule. It's just like the one in the 700Rs. And then your apply feed here is gonna feed the intermediate servo itself. Okay, that is robust apply. That's what you wanna see. Let me get you to where you can see into the case and you can watch the band grab the drum. I'm going to spin it, and then we'll hit it. So as long as you get your nozzle all the way into the little port there, you have really, really good seal. And so you'll know right away if there's a problem with the servo, the seals, or the band itself. But from what I'm seeing here, everything looks good. All right, so now what we need to do is install the center support for the final time and then do one final travel check for the drums against the back of the center support. Okay, now we're ready to lower the center support in for the final time. So. You're going to take off your sizing tool and then you're going to want to lube up the perimeter of the uh, support itself. I mean, it's probably already lubed, but it's worth lubing again. Okay, make sure your thrust washer is in place and then line up your bolt holes to six o'clock position. And carefully lower it into the case.
And if you're slightly misaligned with your bolt holes like I am, you can just take a, a good size punch, stick it in one of the holes, and just kind of gently pry in whichever direction you need to. And that should get you square. And then go ahead and install your two bolts. And you want to install these bolts before you install the snap ring. All right, 10 millimeter. And then for now, I'm just going to snug them up. I'll torque them to spec once we have the belly, you know, horizontal. Okay, snap ring. So again, you want to offset the two ends, 180 degrees out on the opposite side of the case as the uh, parking linkage, lug, and all that stuff. And just be careful with it. You just go around, tap on it, make sure it's fully seated. Appears to be okay. All right. Next section, then we're going to install is the overdrive section. So all that will go in, and then the pump will follow, and then we'll be done with the case. So I'm going to set up that special tool one last time so that we can do our travel check. That feels like it's about 20 to 25 thousandths, which is where you'd want to be. Um, I mean, 15 to 25. I was like 12, 12, 11, 12, 13, somewhere in there. But you want to be between 15 and 25 thousandths. So let me set up the indicator one more time, and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a reading. All right, now we're in a position to take a final travel check here on the drums. And I hope to God that I am within spec because if I'm not, I'm going to have to take all this apart. And then I'm going to have to figure out exactly what I need to do to get myself to where um, I'm meeting specifications. So uh, let's hope and pray. All right, just lift up carefully here on uh, the tool and take a reading. Looks like we're coming right at 24 thousands. Yeah, right at 24 thousands of an inch. Whoo! All right. As long as you're within the prescribed spec range, 15 to 25, uh, with this particular measurement, then you're good to go. There's no reason to overcomplicate it. Okay, we can move on.